goodness. Oh, wow. What a great intro. It is Friday, 5 o'clock. I'm Jeremy Beaver, CEO and founder of Listen Vision with my DJ, the one, the only. Beat of the Boy Wonder. Oh my God, B-Dub, do we have a show for the people today. Yes. Can you think of a better rapper producer? No. Me neither. I couldn't even hit my drop, but no, I can't. Right, right. In just moments, okay. Lord Finesse. Yep. Lead general, founding member of DITC, One producer, MC extraordinaire, will be inducted into the Hip Hop Museum via our... Long and hopefully somewhat entertaining interview. But before we get to that, let's do right now Today in Hip Hop. Unfortunately, today we have to start out with a little piece of sad news, which is that uh, Nancy Wilson has passed away, the Grammy Award winning singer uh, who uh, everyone knows uh, her, her music and her catalog. But specific to hip hop, if you've ever heard OC's Word Life, Gang Stars, The Squeeze, uh, Lords of the Underground, Retaliate, Five Deadly Venoms from Ghostface, Biggie's Rap Phenomenon, and like over 68 others, okay, uh, everyone will miss Nancy Wilson, okay? But in, uh, you know, from, from death to birth, happy birthday to Most Def, a.k.a. Yasin Bey, uh, one of the most unique, talented lyricists in hip-hop. Uh, come check out a really unique, rare piece that we have uh, of a Black Star vinyl in the shape of an actual star signed by him at the uh, Black Star concert uh, just the other month here in Washington, D.C. In, I guess, maker news, Andy Tate is making an open source turntablism device that you can purchase and donate to on Patreon. That's right, the SC-1000 Scratch Instrument is an open source scratching like uh, instrument turntable thing that he is making open source so you can modify it and use it in any way you deem fit. If you watch the video on his Patreon, it's really, really amazing. I, I suggest getting it all you DJs and turntablists out there. It's a really kind of uh, innovative piece that he's doing. Okay, in other news today in hip hop, G Rap and Drez will be at Baltimore Soundstage February 1st. That's right, February 1st. G Rap and Drez. Drez, who was just inducted into the Hip Hop Museum. What was that last That month? is true, yes. Right? And we're still waiting on his jacket, right? He donated his. What, what's up? Drez. What's going come on? Come on, man? brother. We need that jacket, man. The display is going up on the 18th. So come check out the uh, launch party for the Hip Hop Museum on January 18th, 2019, where we will have every display that you can possibly think of known to hip hop's mankind, okay? In other news today in hip-hop, the Woo Wallabies are now available on Woo Wear. Get out so, of here. So, yeah, we unboxed these, what was that, like uh, two uh, shows two ago. Show, yeah, 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 you're Okay. Right. Now, we unboxed the black ones. Unfortunately, Super I guess they've sold dope. out of the yellow colorways. So there's no dope. more yellow colorways. I thought those were the dopest ones. No, I kind of, I was looking at a picture. Hey, DZ, put that picture back up one more second, one more second. What, I like, the, you like the tan ones? No, the black ones was pretty dope. You know, black is my color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love them shits. They're dope. Okay. DZ, how we doing over there? We okay? Oh, no worries, no worries. We don't need to no go worries, back to no that. Worries. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yes. Oh, amazing. So, yeah. So we have those black ones in the collection here at the museum. But if anyone has the yellow colorways, let us know, and we will put them in our collection as well. Okay. Listen, in, in hip-hop or music knowledge, you should know this. If you sell 507-inch, put this image up. If you put sell 507-inch vinyls... It is roughly equivalent to what one million Spotify plays pays. Let me let me repeat that, okay? And shout out to Jake Palumbo, who's uh, there in New York City uh, mixing, I think, Black Moon's newest album, okay? Who 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 posted this? So there's a lots of ways to skin this cat, man. You don't have to, you know, always go for the streaming stuff. How about selling 507 inches? No one's really bragging about that, are they? But it pays just as much as a million Spotify plays. Okay? Uh, let's see. Oh! We are always sending people on hip-hop missions. So the Hip-Hop Museum uh, sent... We had another mission the other day, which was to go up to Chuck Levin's in Wheaton, Maryland. Uh, one of our minions accepted the mission. He took the Bismarcky doll up to the Roland DJ workshop 
at Chuck Levin's. He got the doll signed, he got the box signed, and he got a ticket and money. Ticket to the launch party and, and money just for that hip hop mission. So always check out the Hip Hop Museum's Facebook page for the latest hip hop missions, and you can you can do them for money and, and prizes. Okay. In kind of like Broadway news, we thought this was really cool. Curtis Blow put on the hip hop Nutcracker in Pittsburgh, and I just think it's cool because. No, don't say it. Yeah, he blows the Nutcracker. He blows the nuts on the cracker. Curtis Blow cracks his nuts. Listen. I just think it's cool. If you're doing anything in Broadway, you know, like Lin Wen, Manuel, you know, to bring hip hop into a whole new genre and forum, I think is really incredible. So shout out to Curtis Blow. We love you, brother. And you have some great pieces here in our museum. Uh, in other news, check out this picture from Ernie Panaccioli, who's basically hip hop's, you know, top photographer. Okay. So hip hop's top photographer of all time has this amazing real image. Don't, don't leave this image of, of, LL Cool J and Marley Marl holding up an actual Donald Trump check that, that bounced back in the 80s. And, uh, or actually, 1990, October 23rd, 1990. So, so we knew he was a chump back in New York. We all knew Trump was a chump long before everyone else was hip to it. Anyways, I thought that was funny. In hip-hop art news, check out Lawrence J. He's a dope artist. And he painted or illustrated this uh, Raekwon picture with the purple tape just thought it was dope as fuck that's it that's it dope as fuck all right new year's eve if you're here in washington dc trombone Sh shorty trouble funk and george clinton will all be at the anthem so i think that you should go check them out because trouble funk will also be with grandmaster kaz yep the sugar hill gang yep and melly mel yep on january 18th 2019 for the launch party of the world's first hip-hop museum that's right celebrating the 40th anniversary of rapper's delight with the world's largest collection of hip-hop memorabilia please come and check it out this is what the whole event will be like check check out this video Listen Busy Studios presents the official launch party for the Hip Hop Museum DC on January 18th, 2019. Come celebrate the 40th anniversary of Rapper's Delight and the grand opening of the world's first hip hop museum with historic performances from the Sugar Hill Gang, Trouble Funk, Grandmaster Kaz, and Melly Mel. Doors open at 6 p.m. and tickets are available on hhmdc.eventbrite.com. Call 202-332. 8494 for vending and more info. But be warned, this event will sell out fast. So get your tickets now, January 18th, 2019, for the official launch of the Hip Hop Museum DC. Don't miss this historic event and performances for the 40th anniversary of Rapper's Delight with the Sugar Hill Gang, Trouble Funk, Grandmaster Kaz, and Melly Mel. Call 202-332-8494 for more info and vending. Listen, business. DC's number one recording studio is expanding. Check us out in our big new location at Culture House, 700 Delaware Avenue, Southwest Washington, DC. Offering amazing new podcasting services, one of a kind events, special performances, and digital video and photography. Call 202-332-8494 or go to listenvision.com for rates and info. And we're back. That's right. Friday at 5, District Spotlight. I'm Jeremy Beaver, CEO and founder of Listen Vision with my DJ, the one, the only. B-Dub, the boy wonder. And if you are just tuning in, scooch in just a little bit so that we can hear you real good. We have one of the finest MCs, producers in the entire hip-hop industry of all time, Lord Finesse. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. We, uh, oh, it's, uh, I was just looking at your hat. You have incredible hat game, I gotta say. Every time I see you, you got a very fresh cap on. I've never actually, who makes this hat today? Is that a pro era? Yeah, yeah, that's a new era. New era? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very All fresh. pro era, you know, pro era, new era. New era, same thing. No, something different. Same thing. Something. How was the drive up? Oh, nah, the drive is always smooth, you know, especially when you're not doing the driving. <laughs> Shout out to brother Big Wince in the building. Yeah, when were you here in D.C. last? When was the last time you were here? Oh, good one. Um, it wasn't that long ago. I don't know exactly when, but it wasn't that. Oh, 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 last time I was here, 
is when me and OC did Tiny Dance. Ah. Oh. That's the last time I was here, yep. Did you get a yep. chance to check out the National African American History Museum? Nah, because that'd be like sold out. Like, I know, you know, I know. Somebody hooked me up with some tickets. Hard to get a this ticket. Weekend. Hard to get a ticket. You know, slide me some tickets. I love to go. Y'all watching, man. Y'all heard him. Slide him some tickets, yeah. man. I'm getting it. Well, we'll take care of it. Believe it or not, our old studio manager works there now, so we'll take care of that for okay. you. So, you know, we always start off these kind of induction interviews by asking, you know, you, you legends the same question. And everyone's got a different answer. The question is, what was, if you can remember, what was your first memory of, of hip-hop? What was the first thing you ever heard, ever, in your entire life? that you, you recall being turned on to, you know, hip-hop-wise? Wow, that's a good one. I mean, the first thing I ever heard, wow. I mean, it's going to be either, I would say, uh, Rapper's Delight or, um, I think, uh, Flash and the Furious Five. It's one of those two that was, like, the first, the first thing I was turned on to from a vinyl perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got jams and parties that was like before that with me, you know? So when you heard that, um, were, were you compelled to try to rap over it? Or at what point did you decide, hey, I might want to try this type of, I might want to try this? I think my first time really being inspired and influenced was listening to a Cold Crush tape. I think, you know, they was, they was having a battle against the Fantastic... Fantastic Five, you know, and um, when I heard that tape, it was the energy. It wasn't just the routines was impeccable, but it was the energy from the crowd. If you have a, if you have a good picture, just listening to something and hearing the, the energy, that is like, damn, that that's, that sounds like some fly things went down in there, you know. And it was a live tape, like it, it was them live, battling right, live. Right. So you hear the crowd, you hear the women, you hear hear everybody in unison it's just crazy the energy is what made me say yo i if i did this i think i'd be cool if i get on the stage and i did this and i could get the same response yeah well it's funny you should cite that because we've dug up some rare footage of, of you oh wow and uh well, this first, <laughs> he's already worried. No, he's, he's, he's saying, like, oh, what? wow, right. You, you should have seen the look. Winston, his look at his face. It was like, oh, God, what'd they find? No, the first one everyone's familiar with. And this is a very, very legendary battle. So before we show this footage, tell everybody who Percy P is. Oh, man, Percy P is a rhyme inspector, Patterson Projects, you know? We actually toured uh, Europe together, you know? It was, it was a good one. It was the anniversary, and we was... You know, it was dope. Let's look Perks. at a young Lord Finesse and a young Percy P back in Patterson Projects battling it out. Check out this video. Introduction. My DJ's doing the cutting. So tough MC ain't really saying nothing. I don't need to try to rap, cause I'm fried that. So on the strip troop, you better quad that. Here the temp unite team with dimples. Rockin' fresh rhymes and foggy, but quite simple. I'm forgettable, exceptional. I'm intellectual. Wow. So incredible. Wow. First of all, my, my very first question is has nothing to do with with what you would think. Who took that video? Uh kid named Wu. Wolves from Patterson, shout out to Wool. I mean that that battle was a battle that was very spoken about before it was done. So it just happened to have it just happened to have that 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 camcorder ready. You know, so that I was, wonder if this battle would be as infamous if it hadn't been you know, like, trust me, when I... Do you know how many times it's been viewed and shared on YouTube? I mean... That's, I think that's what makes it the dopest, is yeah. that you could talk about... You could talk about all these different battles, but to actually see it and witness it from the footage standpoint... feel like you're there. It feels like you're there. And who won the first one? 
I mean, I let the crowd decide. First, first is my dude, you know, so I don't, I don't want to go into that. So that I think this is really interesting, answer, you know, for people. Remember, uh, you know, finesse. A lot of people that watch our show are folks that might be, you know, let's say under thirty or y- younger than us. So we also have a responsibility to kind of educate them. You know, they they might be familiar with you because of your work with Dre or Biggie. You know what I mean? The right, big right, stuff you've right. done, but they don't know about like, hey, if you were battling this guy. Why'd you put them on your albums? They don't understand. You know what I mean? Like, what was your relationship? How? What, what was your guy's relationship like if you could battle them in one second and then be putting them on a track the next? But if anybody knows, that's that's what happened with AG. I battled AG first. And then when um, I was working on Funky Technician, he happened to be dating a, a, a woman from across the street, a chick from across the street. And I just asked him, like, was he still rapping? He said yes. Like, to me, it, it, some, I mean, still sharp and still, you know? So I never looked at it like when you're confident in what you do and the ability in what you do it in, I mean, what, why does it hurt to give somebody else they, they props or, or put them on something or do something together with them? I think, I think when, I mean, I'm secure with what I do. I'm secure with who I am. So, purse is purse is purse is an alien, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't I don't feel bad saying that because he's just that talented. And he ended you know? up uh, going on to become a uh, music industry executive. Is that right? Didn't he work at one of the labels at um, one point? I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I don't that, know. Oh, we'll look into know? that. We'll look you into that. Have to fact check that. Right. You know? But um. <laughs> So when you were working with Percy, you know, uh, you you guys both had already established your names. I mean that literally. Like you were already Lord Finesse. He was already Percy P. When that battle happened. But the funny thing, that was the battle just before the seminar the next day for me. So I went from one battle battling the Percy into the New Music Seminar in 1989, the exact next day. So those are two monumental days for me. I didn't know they were back to back. They were back to back. Damn, were you just ex- mentally exhausted after that? Or what were you feeling that weekend no, or whatever? I think when, when you balance somebody like Purse, there's not too many people like Percy, you know, Percy P. So when I battled them, and when I was looking at the level of competition at the seminar, it was like night and day, it was different. So it actually gave me more confidence for the seminar because people that battle I had with Purse, that was it's a tough battle. And what that year was, was that? Four or five rounds. That was like 1989. 89. So your this was right before your album, your first album dropped. Right. Uh, I started working on Funky Technician exactly as soon as the seminar was over. Me and Premier started working on Funky Technician. That's why. Do you yeah. think that you were motivated at all? Like to like that, like your passion was a little greater having come off of those two wins? Well, my my passion wasn't to do records at the time. My passion was to be the best. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to prove to the world that I was nice enough to compete against anybody. When I say anybody, anybody. So that was more my drive versus making records. I think when I wanted to make records, I was still in high school. I wanted, you know, I thought that would be cool to do a record and still be in high school. I was like, yeah, because then, you know, your record playing on the radio and you're going <laughs> You just saw all the girls. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I mean, who did, you know? <laughs> well, so. speaking of all the girls, okay, and let's talk about, you know, uh, well, this is Return of the Funky Man, but look, can we get a close up of this? I really want you guys to see the shorts he has on. Okay. Look, look about, talk about getting all the girls. Look at this, look at those legs. This dude here. Look, look at those shorts. Look at, look at, look, look at your DJs. Well, those are Z Cavarici shorts, probably. Yeah, I mean, he has on. Like I mean, I this said, is. You gotta be confident to wear shorts like this. You know? <laughs> right, for real. Yeah, I'm looking like that, uh, like. <laughs> you know, I was like when the Knicks was wearing sh- super shorts. Right, you know? right, right. Those are those are the uh, John Stark shorts right there. That's so funny. Anyways, I'm sorry. I was, I, was, I was noticing that earlier. So then, like, you know, you're a, you're a competitive guy. We get that. Right. But then, what what made you want to put it in record? I mean, uh, you know, Funky Technician. Most people consider to be um, a masterpiece, a gem. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Uh, 
while it's critically acclaimed, I definitely think it's underexposed and underrated. I think so. Do you know? So what what made you? I mean, I hear I was listening to it on the car this morning. It sounds like a lot of time and effort put. It doesn't sound like a guy who didn't want to put an album together. Why'd you do it? I mean, after after the seminar, that's that was the only thing left to do. Oh, okay. I wasn't gonna stay battling on street corners. I had to go up a, a few notches, but um. That was actually, I was still in high school at that time when making that. I was in summer school uh, trying to get the last bit of my credits to graduate. I graduated January 1990, so put that out there. But um, <laughs> I remember that because after, after summer school, I would literally go to my grandma's crib. I would change my gear and then get my rhyme book or whatever and go straight to the studio. So it was like from summer school home real quick into the studio. So some a lot of some of that stuff was crafted on the train because I were you considering the, what you might do if if the rapping so like you you perfectly transitioned from high school into like a professional rap career, but right. like what would you be your fallback plan? What if that you hadn't gotten signed and put out well, that album? Well, rapping wasn't the first plan. That was actually the second plan. What was the first plan? Being an electrical engineer was my first plan. But when I got to Park West, that program was no longer there. So I just found myself in the gym and in the lunchroom rhyming all the time. So that's where I felt my skills started to transition and I started getting sharp at what I was doing. And then that's where I went and started wanting to battle everybody. Because you just don't want your friends to say you nice. It's a whole nother level of respect when you could go to different neighborhoods and and claim that reputation too. So I think when I started making records, the word was out from a street battle perspective and it was just transitioning into making records. And so where was uh, Funky Technician recorded? Uh, Funky Technician was recorded in such a sound Brooklyn. It was not in Brooklyn. The name of the studio was called Such a Sound Studios, and it was in Brooklyn. And you would travel from the Bronx to Brooklyn? My man Slow Mo. Yeah. How long did um, it take you to make it? Wow. Not long. Because you figured I started right after the seminar. So we talking about August, September. Baby You Nasty was out October 8th, 89, I think, if I'm right. Um, Funky Technician came out February 6th, 1990. Wait, wait, so that sounds like it took you two months to make your debut album? I I just had a bunch of rhymes, you know? Damn, so how many of the songs on Funky Funky Technician were like like rhymes that, you know, legit rhymes, they're like, this is my go-to, and how many were new? Hmm, good question. I think um, Baby You Nasty was kind of new. Bad Mother was kind of pre-written. Keep It Flowing was new. Um, Back to Back Rhyming was pre-written. Lesson to Be Taught was new. Uh, Here I Come was new. Like, I could just remember. Right, but there sounds like at least a couple joints that might have been, like, written when you like were 16 Slave, or something, right? Slave to My Soundwave might have been one of the last records. Yeah. Wow. I'm just always amazed, you know, like, when we were interviewing MC Search, you know, and he was telling us, yeah, you know, I was going to school to be an Italian opera singer. And then all of a sudden, the next thing I knew, Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh were in my lunchroom, and, uh, yeah, fuck opera singing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, people got to understand, hip-hop was more of a cultural thing. That's what grabbed us. It was the culture. It was the gear. It, it was a lot of things. It was the b-boy. It was the b-boy aspect. It was the graffiti. It was the break dancing. It's something that if you had talent in one of the elements, you felt like that's my way to get in. Whether if it was the dancing or the DJing or the rapping or the graph. You know? And in New York, you know, I'm also from New York, and, and growing, um, we're close in age. This time in New York, it was everywhere. Yeah, it's it's hard I mean, to describe to people. It was very infectious. It was the hottest, coolest, and it was new to us. 
and it was fun to us. Well, I, I credit I credit a lot of different people for different things. I credit Jazzy J, the original Jazzy J, the, the incredible, iconic Jazzy J. In fact, J. I'd like you to do a, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'd like to do a close-up on this. Uh, he, he thanked him on his, uh, on Return of the Funky Man. You know, Jazzy J, talk, talk, talk about, oh, sorry, I'm down here. Talk about, special thanks to Jazzy J, talk about Jazzy J, the very first artist ever signed to Def Jam Records and what he meant to you in your career. A lot. I mean, a lot. Uh, Jazzy J was sneaking me in a club he was doing called Dance Ateria when I was about maybe 14, 15 years old. So, you know, it was. Dance Ateria. Dance Like cafeteria, but Dance Ateria? It was called Dance Ateria. And he used to play that party. It was downtown in Manhattan. And that's the first time I got to see, like, DMC and all these artists walking around 1 a.m., 2 a.m. at night and hearing all this funk and soul. And that's, that, that kind of influenced me to go, damn, if I can make music and hang out at night and hang, hang out with these iconic heroes and stars, you know. So, no, I think, I think Jazzy J, like, I mean, we, we always talk about He made you see it was possible. Yeah, he definitely. How'd you first meet him? It was possible. I mean, <clears throat> Jazzy J was uh, dating, like, my, my friend, his name was Carlos Calito, born unique. Um, he lived on the 11th floor and Jay was dating his sister. So, you know, he would give Kalito the passes to go to, um, Dance Ateria and that was my boy. So we would go together, you know? Oh so my goodness. That's, so that's how that worked out. And, and it's interesting when you talk about it and you look back upon kind of the thread, you know what I mean, of how the career was kind of put together, you know what I mean, one person showing you this door, giving you this opportunity, you know, I always find that fascinating. In fact, you know, you were signed to Wild Pitch, right. uh, kind of pre-Search, so, uh, right. you know, Search is a good friend of the, the museum and the show, and, uh, you know, Search, after, uh, you know, the third base thing, went to go work for... Uh, wild pitch and ended up right. signing you know OC, OC. but you, you know you predate all of that stuff so tell me about just at least briefly what wild pitch was like back in your day which is really kind of the early days of wild pitch well i mean it was it's the story is like this when i got signed to wild pitch it wasn't because of well it's the president owned the label which is Stu fine him and his wife amy ran a label but it was guru and DJ Word that picked out my tape to take the Stu. And Stu wasn't big on Law Finesse at that time. I don't know his voice is, ah. You know, and they were like, nah, you, you gotta sign this Stu. So during the seminar, he had Premier. Premier was fresh from Texas at that time. This is post No More Mr. Nice Guy or pre No More Mr. This nice is, Guy? That was already recorded. This is already but out. Gangstar is already out. Right, Premier is transitioning to New York. Right. And Stu had Premier in the crowd at the seminar, and he was like, well, you know, he signed this dude, uh, Finesse, and I just want your honest opinion. Check him out, you know? So Premier is watching me in the seminar, and, you know, Premier is like, man, you know, I want to work with him. So, yeah, you know, you made the right thing. Wait, I back mean, to the seminar again. Back to the seminar, yes. That's when Premier first All roads. got to, wow. to see what I was about. And then Premier ended up producing how many tracks on the, uh, on the He should have really been executive producer uh -huh. because I give Premier that because he kind of scoped the album. So even though you had Diamond Land Beach, you had Show, you had Mike Smooth, he was kind of making sure I was in pocket with everything. So even though he didn't produce every song, he was literally at every session. So, Premier did Strictly for the Ladies. He did Baby You Nancy, the first and the second version. And we was doing, uh, we was going to do, uh, he, he actually did a remix to track the movement. But it was too long, so we never used it. But that exists somewhere? Yeah, I got that. Okay, yeah. note to self. All right. Let's fast forward here a little bit, okay? Because uh, you got to be a real audio or hip hop nerd to really, you know, get into the weeds of this type of stuff, okay? Let's fast forward to really kind of the pinnacle of Finesse's career, 
um, right when he's really, really catching fire. This is a 1993 video clip with Fab Five Freddy and pretty much the entire crew at this point. Uh, DZ, take it away. Hey, yo, Fab. Hey, yo, Lord, Finesse in the house. Well, we back on your TV raps, and uh, we was just speaking about the brother Lord Finesse, how he is. What's up, Lord Finesse? What's going on? The brother Show in the house, AG in the house. All right. Yeah, yeah. So, yo, we was just talking about like them, those freestyle sessions y'all used to have, man. So, why don't we like, get a little something going on here, you know what I'm saying? Want to do a little something? Take the mic, baby. Take it back, take it back. You got it. Uh, check it out, check it out, check it out. We gonna do it like this. Uh, check it out. Now it's the grand majestic, so don't even test it. Am I finesse from the Bronx? Yeah, money, you guessed it. But peep it. Don't try to run around and speak it. Point blank, I keep my way about secret. Hardcore rock more, money I clock more. I'm making more noise than a nine in the block wall. I get respect and wreck, cause my facts be real. I'm eating steaks while you're messing with Happy Meals. Me get slain, be for real last game. I'm crazy quick to blow a brother out the frame. I speak clearly so those could hear me. That's my theory. Me take a law so really. None could do me, school me, rule me, or even fool me. My skills are briar than jewelry. I'm no joke or slowpoke. My rap was down, folks. I'm hitting girls up on a downstroke. So I'm pass it up to my man, Dre, you know what I'm saying? Check it. Check it. All right. Let's see, let's see. We're gonna do it like this now. Bust this now. Yo, get your crucifix and your holy Bible. Cause at first I was your idol. Now you're getting suicidal. You thought the flow was gone. Fans kept holding on to Drake. There you have it. If you're just tuning in, uh, we are sitting with the one, the only, Lord Finesse. Producer, MC, businessman. I'm Jeremy Beaver, CEO and founder of Listen Vision with my DJ, the one, the only... B-Dub the Boy Wonder. So, so it, was only, it was only just a few months ago that we were inducting uh, AG into the, uh, into the museum, and I wanted to show you something that I thought was kind of neat. So we have uh, some of the you know pieces in your display at the museum are here. We're going to have you sign them at the end of the show, but... We found something that, to, I don't know why I fucking love this piece of memorabilia. I'm going to show this to you in a second. I, you may, maybe you've seen it before. I fucking love, I think this is just like the coolest piece of merch that's maybe ever existed in merch. You know what I mean? You know, and, and the fact that every member of the crew, you know what I mean, is represented in their own stamp. And when Diamond was with us, you know, he signed it. Unfortunately, AG is so far out in Japan, he can't even get mail. But when when we get him here, we'll, you know, and obviously we'll have you sign it too. Tell me what, at what point did you decide? I mean, you already said steel sharpens steel, but tell us what gave you the the confidence to put together one of the most iconic talented rap crews of producers and MCs in the history of mankind. What made you want to do that? Well, it, it really starts off with Show and Diamond. They came up with the whole DITC digging in the crates thing because that, that's what they was doing. Uh, him and Diamond was digging in the crates. It was just me just having an opportunity to meet different people and, and pull them into what we was doing, whether it be AG, whether it be Buck Wow, whether it be uh, Big L, you know, OC was a thing where me and Buck was on a source tour and um, Buck and OC formed a, 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 a nice rapport and where they said like after the, pro after the, 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 the tour, they wanted to do a project and that became Word Life. So I was just happy to be the one that put the pieces in the right place. But the the credit of the whole thing really goes to Show and Diamond because that was, you know, it was just me being a part. I mean, digging in the crates really start from, you know, Show, Diamond, and then me and AG. Diamond and Show started rhyming because they had a session, but they had a beat going and AG missed the session. And I wish I had that that record is that record is worth more than gold. That record is priceless. And who was the MC on it? Diamond and Show. 
and they produced the beat. Yes. They never produced the beat out. together. It never came out. They rapped on it together. Choked it. Murdered it. And this track exists somewhere? I don't know. I used <laughs> We're going to find that one. We're going to find this. But they they actually just straight murdered. I mean, really just killed it. Going back and forth at that. Yeah. And you were you witnessed this? No, I came in the session late. It wasn't my session. Right. But I had I used to have the cassette tape of that. What? And I I gotta really look because I something telling me I still something tell me I I don't throw nothing away. Right. Oh really? Yeah. I don't. Oh. I really well, we at the museum like a we'll musical hoarder there for that yeah. musical hoarder right. Yeah. Well, well, wait a second then. You're with all of these producers, and at the time you're an MC. At what, what point did you start producing? I think I started producing right after, oh, I would say it was during Return of the Funky Man, but I was being assisted by Jay and the engineers. So I think the first session where I actually did it with me and wasn't assisted putting it together is when I did You Know What I'm About for the Trespass soundtrack. I had originally did a song with Big L and Warner didn't want to use that version so I had to go back and do it over and I actually left the Source Tour, the Source Tour I was talking about where Buck and OC was and I came up and I went in the studio and knocked that out in four hours and got back in the limo and took that down. The show was actually in DC, That's it's crazy that we're here but yeah. And so, so. how did you how did you even get tapped for the Trespass soundtrack? That was Ice T. He got me tapped for the Trespass soundtrack. He got me tapped for the Class Act soundtrack. And you know, at the time, the person that brought me that got me signed to Giant was let go. So that's why Return of the Funky Man only had one video. So after that one video, I felt like all the support was gone. So. I just wanted to do something or learn something different and I wanted to take my hand in production and I went and took the trespass money and brought the 1200 and the 950 and that began like the production thing and uh, the, the first beat you heard, the first beats I've ever produced was on Lifestyles of the Poor and Dangerous and Living Fat for Fat Joe. So literally, when I got my machine, the, the 12 and the 950, those are the very first beats. You do understand what that sounds like. Is like, yeah, the first time I ever picked up a baseball bat, I hit a home run for the Yankees. That's what that sounds like. That's not a normal sentence, finesse. It's, it's not normal. I mean, but <laughs> you have to understand, like, my background and who I'm around plays a very, a very great part in to being who I am. So you gotta understand, at the time, I'm around Premier. I'm around show. During the time he's doing the the runaway slave for for um payday. Then I'm hanging with Large Professor. That's the the, the high school genius right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think learning all the different things from each of these people along with Jess West because Jess West taught me the taught me the uh, Makai S950 not only did he teach me it he what's taught, that the rack mount unit that's the rack mount yep. he taught me how to time stretch on that so I was time mm. stretching with a 950 way back with when. the little press buttons and right? it was him that introduced me to Puff that started the whole biggie thing Lots of connections. But yeah. it sounds like you got a little bit, you know, as because I'm an old DJ and producer, when you start learning how to use that equipment, you either are like, I fucking love this and want to do this all day, every day, or you're like, yo, this is fucking annoying. I don't want to do this. It sounds to me like you got a little addicted. Yeah, you, you have no choice to get addicted. I think when you start collecting records and you start learning about these different artists and with your technical skill and you learning different things, you, it, it's an addiction. Yeah, it was But this addiction. is already an addiction that started after you were already a professional a MC. Because you got to understand, Show and Diamond was doing it years prior. Right. And they was trying to get me into that. Right. But it took, I guess, the whole thing with Return to Funky Man not to go the way I wanted to go into that direction. Well, you were, you were a stubborn individual because then you produced every track on Awakening. 
Yeah, except uh, except the, the so hidden speak tracks, your piece right. and actual facts. But everything but else. But everything else. No. When I got into that zone of the awakening, I was full, full all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I knew everything I wanted and I would sit there and craft all these different things. If it wasn't for OC, I think um, uh, Jewels would have been an interlude on Awakening. It wouldn't even have been a song. He took Well, you had a bunch of very short interludes that were really fucking cool on Awakening. Right. What, yeah. what were they meant to be short like that, or yeah. were they meant to be full songs? Yeah, that was. I think that was like the tribe Pete Rock effect. Okay. You know, when okay. they had the interludes yeah. going. But I wanted something like that. But I wanted people rhyming on it, and they came out the way they came out. And like the whole light thing, she just happened to be in the studio, and I had a beat going, and I grabbed her out of her session. Go, yo, light, could you talk on this real quick? And she heard Good. it like, yo, wow, you know? I'm not surprised because while she was a great addition to that album, she's the only person that when you listen to her, you go, oh, wow, okay, wasn't expecting her on this album. Yeah, that's, that, but that's, that's what it so was about. That's so dope, though. That's so dope. having fun. I mean, Awakening was, I, that was my, that's my favorite album because I know the time I put into making it. The hip to the game, especially when I did it, and I heard it, and it was like, yo, I got to I got That's one of the this. sickest beats it, ever, it yeah. It felt so good, and that's what people don't understand. Hip-hop is supposed to feel good. It's supposed to, you're supposed to have a, that's why them classics, when you're listening to Tribe with Check the Rhyme and Electric Relaxation and the, the Gangstar records and the Nice and Smooth records, they feel great. It's the energy, it's the vibe to them. And with The Awakening, what happened was, I got a beat from Jess West. Really, Mike Lowe and Jess West did it together, which was actual facts. And what was cool about Neil being on penalty, he would let me do anything I want. Really? He said, look, I signed you. You law finesse. I believe in you. Do whatever you want. We'll figure out the promotion and the marketing strategy later. So I said, I had this idea. I want to do a song with Lars Professor, Sadat X, and Grand Pooba. It was just a concept. It was a concept, but I told him how I had to do it to make it happen. I could make it happen like that tomorrow, but you know, record labels, they get corporate. Like, yo, you know, for for them to be on it, tell them to come in and fill out a W-9 and this and that. And I was like, nah, don't do that. Here's what I'm going to do. Give me a document with them stating and signing it, and I need it all in cash. So now it's just calling. And they let you move like that. Yeah, it was just That's calling a lot of them trust. and saying, look, if you drop this verse, I got the cash right now. Who's going to say no to that? Nobody. Artists just like, oh, oh, bet. And they signed off. Here's your envelope. Here's your envelope. And it got done like that. And Puba really liked the record. And um, I remember at the time, Puba had a notorious rep for not showing up. He just come to wherever you want to come when he want to come. So it was just like, um, I was telling Neil, I want to shoot a video for it. Now, at that time, I done spoke to Pooba already. Pooba like, yo, man, let's let's do it. I'm down. Uh, Neil was terrified. Yo, what if Pooba don't come? <laughs> I don't know. And, man. Had you paid him yet? Or no, you had still nah, had the cash on him? No, I paid him for the verse. He did the verse. I wanted to do a video now. Uh, and he was scared that Pooba wasn't going to show up. And I was like, nah, Pooba is my dude. And not not for nothing, Pooba was the first one there. Ooh. So it kind of like, oh, shit, he came first. <laughs> he actually you know? came. So, yeah, and then it was dope because I had a relationship with, if you look at that Awakening album, very, I, I like the album and, and I love the videos because I had fun making them. Yeah. So I told him I had a jazz concept. So if you look at the video, you got Karis one on the piano. You got Fat Joe on the bass. You had Diamond on the drums. You had, like, uh, Evil D cutting. You had Fat Man Scoop introduce me before Fat Man Scoop was, was this, anybody. this incredible energy right now. Right, right. So it was a fun video. You had Elliot. You had Akinelli there. Trash came late. 
you know, but it was a fun, it was a fun video. Well, I mean, all of that passion and energy comes across because most people, when they look at your catalog, Awakening, just in hip hop terms, right. is one of the most classic albums uh, in in all of hip hop. It, 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 I mean, it was a, it, it's a classic. People call it a classic, but it didn't start off like that because during the time I was doing it, you had Bad Boy, you had all this commercial stuff and yeah. people thought Yo, you tripping you doing this musical album this don't fit into what's going on this the jiggy era this is this this is that why are you doing this type of music yeah. and to me it was a feel it wasn't me worrying about what anybody else was painting it was a it was a portrait that i was painting that i thought it was unique now when people go back and listen to it, it's like yo that was, yo, it was crazy, but I'm like, it ain't get that notoriety at that time. It was a slow burn. So, you know, when people when people say, well, what you going to do now? And it's just like, yo, I'm going to do something now. It's going to be ill. Just trust me, and hopefully it don't take y'all 15 or 20 years like <laughs> to that, you figure know? out it's a classic. Right. Well, let me just kind of toot your own horn here, because uh, for the people that are producers and fans of producers you know ev everyone holds you in such high esteem really in the, in the top five hip-hop producers of all time uh, and let me just list for our young cats the people that you've some of the folks that you've produced for uh, Biggie Big L OC Compona Noriega Fat Joe Jay-Z Dr. J KRS-One MC Light uh, Artifacts AG Sadat X Large Program Pooba. And, and that's just a tiny drop in the bucket because clearly when you got into producing, you found a love and a passion. And, and the most common question we got for you from all of our viewers was, which do you prefer? If you had to pick one and, and, and you're on a desert island, that's you're tough. either given a, a microphone or you're given an SP-1200. The microphone does record on a computer and you will have beats, but you can't make beats. You're on the desert island. Which are you going to choose? From one of the three? No, you have to either, on the desert island, you're either producing or rapping. You have to pick one. I would say rapping. I mean, no, I would say production. Because, um, and I, I, I say that because production has longevity. I can do production when I'm 80 years old. It doesn't stop. Being an artist, I only got a nice window left to do that you know and you know i'm blessed to be almost 30 years in so i know the window for law finesse the the artist microphonist that's only i got a i got a window to do what i'm going to do next with it you know producing quincy jones proved to the world that you could still produce something like thriller when you 50 so right i mean i look at Quincy for that, but I just feel like I just feel like you know how you play a full, you play a couple of full courts of basketball and you tie it and you just get that second win. Yeah. And you play another five games. Yeah. I feel I'm at the second route of the five games. Yeah. You know, because I I, I love music and I get irritated when people try to put an expiration by age on music. Because if you love music and you're great at it, don't don't let nobody put an expiration on your age that you can't do what you do. As long as you do it at a high level and you're great at it, I mean, I'm passionate about it. I'm my own worst critic. So if I don't like it, you ain't going to hear it. And I take what I do and what I've done personal because, you know, I got people out there that that really count on me to, to do the things I do and I, I want to be great at them. I don't want to do them because I can do them. That's like Jordan when he was playing for the Wizards, you know? Having to be in D.C. again. But, um, <laughs> that's that's okay, when he had having to play for the Wizards and he was good with like 10 points and one rebound. I'm, nah. If yeah. I can't score 40, I'm not playing. Mm. You know, and that's how it goes. Uh, speaking of, you know, scoring 40 the um the longevity of not just your music but a lot of the golden era hip-hop i think has exceeded everybody's expectations 
Um, I think um, the fact that we're hitting all of these anniversaries, you know, 25th anniversary of that, 30th anniversary of that, and everybody's still showing it that much love and passion shows what you're talking about, that if, as a, from a production level, that can really last on and on and on. But from an MC level, have you considered putting out any new projects? Yeah, I got one in the chamber. I got, you know, I'm just trying to top the awakening. Like, I'm not, I don't want to go backwards. I want to still show people I'm greater than I was before. And that's that's a tall glass of water right there. Because I listen to some of my old stuff and go, mm. wow. You know, yeah, right. because, you know, I was that passionate. The only thing right now, I just think it's having fun with it. I think it all boils down to having fun with music because that's what it was. When we were doing the whole digging in the crates, we was having fun. You know, it wasn't a corporate thing. It wasn't about what it is now, streaming and views. And it was just having fun, knowing that your music can compete with today's music. But you got to understand, we had a, a diverse platform that played everything. Now it gets complicated because they're trying to drown you with a certain sound. And they're not giving you that diversity where you get, as a customer, get to choose, well, I like this, I don't like that. It's just, here's this. You know, here's just steak. Might not want steak. You might want chicken. You might want, you know, lamb. You might want seafood, fish. And they just ramming one steak. type of thing. Yeah. And it, it's, it's bad because... You, you trying to tell me that's all that's out there? That's all that people want? And and it's, it's a payola thing. You can't tell me it's not. Because, you know, it doesn't have nothing really with the DJs taking the money. Well, some of them anyway. But if that money goes upstairs and a list comes downstairs and, here, this is what y'all need to play, that's what y'all got to play. Well, I hate to say this then. Do, do we, and more you have some sort of obligation then to provide this generation and the next generation with more palatable food as you have in the past. If we're say, seeing, right, our young people consuming, I guess, musical junk food, right? Right. Do we, you, have an obligation to put out some some new organic greens? Well, yes, I, that's why I want to do a label next year. That's what I'm doing next year. It's called um, Underworld Label Group. And um, what I want to show, it's also showing people that I just don't do one thing. Because I do R&B, I do different types of music, I do different genres. But it's like when people speak on the artist, sometimes I think they pre really pre-speak on an artist before really understanding the different dynamics and facets of the artist. Like, I've been doing R&B, I've been doing this, but they just... Boom bap. That's all he does. Boom bap. Mm, mm. So for certain people, we would love him to do this, but oh, we heard he just do boom bap. So it's right. it's it's my job to show people I do different things, and I think I blame myself for not being consistent because you have to understand you have a growing have a growing audience, you have a growing base out there. So if you go into the store looking for a certain brand and that brand is not in the store, after a while, you're just going to be happy with another brand. It might not be as good. It might not taste as good, but hey, man, it's close. You right. know, so I blame myself because I think if I've been consistent, I think it wouldn't have been room for a lot of these other producers if I would have kept at it. But, you know, everybody go through their trials and tribulations in life. Of certain things happening to them that make them do certain yeah. things they do. But also on the flip side of that, there also wouldn't be a lot of genius, beautiful, amazing artists in hip hop if you hadn't existed, right? So while you're saying you you might have let room in the game for some of these garbage artists, you also birthed a lot of talented folks who well, wouldn't like, be producing like if it I weren't said, for you. One, once again, it's just like if I hear talent. I know what talent is. The difference between me and an A and R, they gotta see it all dressed up. You know, I'm a chef. I could tell you from the ingredients, ingredients. it's gonna be dope. Mm -hmm. You don't have to bake the cake and put the frosting on for me to sell me something. Right. I could just hear it and go, that's dope. And as a producer, it's your job 
to groom an artist to be greater than and foresee something that they don't see already. Yeah. And that's what it's about. We don't get that now. They want it already done. They want everything. And I tell a lot of artists, it's about your brand. It's about you promoting yourself. If you just going to throw music out on the internet and you ain't going to roll up your sleeves and go do interviews and go do showcases, just hang it up. Why are you in it for? You yeah. know, so it's up to the artist to go roll up their sleeves and really make it happen and make our voice be felt, make our presence be felt. Because if we don't do that, that's why we're not being felt. Because we're only thinking it's on iTunes, it's on YouTube. I done my job. No, 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 right. no, 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 no. You're going to have to really go out there and show people you're about it. And if you're not going to do that, it's, it's going to be early. It's going to be an early night for you. People say music only lasts two weeks or people got a short attention span. That's because people just throw out certain things and think it's going to catch fire. You got to push it. Come on, man. Bruno Mars, the record right now with Cardi B. That record is two years old. How, how can Bruno Mars do it? How can he remix a record and throw it out and give life to a record that was two years old? So all this, yo, they don't got the... And then it, you have to know the demographics that you're chasing after. When I ask an artist, who are you making your music for? Don't go with that, oh, if he could do it, I can do it. He might have a plan. He might have a marketing strategy. So your music might not work how his music is working. It's about having a plan, a strategy to know your music is going to reach people and stop thinking locally and start thinking globally. That's another thing dudes think, man. It's not just about your neighborhood. It's, it's 51 other states out there. It's a whole nother world. It's different continents and countries. And, and dudes just think that if you can't make it happen in your town, you know it's good to be a hometown hero, but it's different to be an international hero. Yeah, amen to that. And I know AG would, would concur on that one. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a break. We're going to go to the video of uh, the launch party, the launch event for the world's first hip-hop museum here in Washington, D.C. That's going to be on January 18th with the Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Kaz, Melly Mel, and Trouble Funk. Okay, and when we come Trouble back, Funk. yeah, which, they, you know, they were also signed to Sugar Hill Records. Of course. Yeah, of, of course. course. Well, we, we know this. A lot of people don't know why, that. That's uh, why Melly Mel did that record. Um, oh, man. Man, it's on the top of my tongue. But Trouble Funk played the music. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. The whole, the whole universe knew the king was me. I said, come on. I said, come on. That Big Tony's going to freak when I play this back for him. Yeah. So uh, check out this video, and when we come back, the actual induction ceremony for Lord Finesse. Stay tuned. Presents the official launch party for the Hip Hop Museum DC on January 18th, 2019. Come celebrate the 40th anniversary of Rapper's Delight and the grand opening of the world's first hip hop museum with historic performances from the Sugar Hill Gang, Trouble Funk, Grandmaster Kaz, and Melly Mel. Doors open at 6 p.m. and tickets are available on hhmdc.eventbrite.com. Call 202 332 8494 for vending and more info. But be warned, this event will sell out fast. So get your tickets now, January 18th, 2019, for the official launch of the Hip Hop Museum DC. Don't miss this historic event and performances for the 40th anniversary of Rapper's Delight with the Sugar Hill Gang, Trouble Funk, Grandmaster Kaz, and Melly Mel. Call 202 332 8494 for more info and vending. And we're back. Unbelievable. If you're just tuning in, this is District Spotlight every Friday at 5. I'm Jeremy Beaver, CEO and founder of Listen Vision with my DJ, the one, the only... B-Dub the Boy Wonder. That's right. It's official. It's really happening. Right now, I'd like to take the opportunity to speak some incredibly true words about a man who has changed many people's lives, musically, um, personally. Lord Finesse, your music has influenced thousands of MCs. Your beats influenced millions of producers to become producers. If it weren't for you, hip hop would not be what it is. Right now, can everyone give a round of applause? For the induction, Lord Finesse. 
So congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, from everyone here at the Hip Hop Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, we have a unique responsibility to preserve hip hop, commemorate legends like yourself, and also educate the next generation. Um, I don't know if, if you guys saw on the break, all of this will be on display on January 18th. So right here, he signed his own stamp. <laughs> Not too many people have their own stamp. Uh, if you want to give us your John Hancock, let's see, uh, maybe gold would look good on this. I don't know, maybe this one would look good. This is his SB1200 project. Okay, so that is also going to go into the museum. One of the other cool things about uh, Lord Finesse that most people don't even realize, uh, you know, if you don't, you're living under a rock. But, you know, DJ Premier wouldn't be who he is if it weren't for linking up with Lord Finesse and wild pitch and all of that uh great music this is an incredible pretty unique uh picture disc actually of keep the crowd listening um so did you produce any mixes on this or is this all premiere uh, just, the intro. just the intro also doesn't lord finesse have the dopest logo look at that logo you guys who designed your logo it was uh it was it was a combination because if you look inside the logo of the diamond with the crown on top, that's Eric Orr. And then my boy Jun Jun for Japan, when they crafted a t-shirt, they took my logo and put it in the spade and added the rest. So it's a combination of Eric Orr and my man Jun Jun, uh, BBP. You know? Eric Orr, the artist with the uh, yes. kind of space alien figure? Yes, that's the one who oh, did that's the, so cool. the Diamond logo. That's the one who did the Showbiz and AG logo. That's the one who did the Jazzy Day Strong City logo. That's the one who did the Busy B logo and a ton of others I'm probably just missing out on. Shout out Eric Orr, who I think is one of my Facebook friends. <laughs> I'm going to make a note to tag him on this. Uh, so if you're watching right now, if you're just tuned in, uh, you're watching Lord Finesse sign his own memorabilia and pieces for literally his own display in the Hip Hop Museum. Every single one of these pieces will be in kind of like a beautiful shadow box uh, at the museum. Uh, but while you're doing this, what we're going to do is something that we do every single episode, which is unbox pieces of hip hop history. Okay. Beat up. That's yours. All right, so feel free to turn the beats up there in the background a little. Coming in all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Anyone in the house from Atlanta, Georgia? Grab some scissors for the back, please. Daisy, grab some scissors real quick. Here you go, Vita. Oh my God, look at this, you guys. This is perfect. Uh, because we just got in our Death Row Records electric chair. I suspect this will be displayed. Well, don't throw scissors. Let's not please, throw please them. Don't, please it's don't. okay. It's okay. Let's not throw them. But in the meantime, let's take a look at this incredible picture disc from NWA, straight out of Compton Picture Disc, which will be on display right next to the uh, Death Row Records electric chair on January 18th at the grand opening of the Hip Hop Museum. So make sure you're there. You might have to keep going. You know how they do these boxes, bro. You know how okay. they do it. Coming in all the way from North Hollywood, California. Anyone here from uh, Hollywood or California? Oh yeah, okay. Well, I could tell by your hat. So the cool thing about all these pieces that come into the Hip Hop Museum is that we never know where they're coming from, and we never know exactly what they are. Oh, gee, scissors would be helpful, wouldn't they? Do you ever meet uh, the guys of NWA, Lord Finesse? Did you ever listen to their music? Of course, who hasn't? What do you got? 
What do you got over there? Dude, you got something great. Show that. I'm going to show this. Coming all the way from Kansas. Lenexa, Kansas. I don't even know what the city called. Wow. Lenexa, Takes Kansas. a nation of millions. Signed by Chuck D and oh, Flavor Flav. Yep, yep. Going directly into the Hip Hop Museum with... Oh, my God. I can't believe we just got this so simple like that. All right, so check this out. This is super, super hip-hop history. Ready? Okay, here we go. In three, two, one. NWA's very first record label, McCola Record Company. This is an incredibly rare satin jacket from the McCola Record Company. And if you don't know, that is the very first label to put out... NWA. So this will all be on display at the Hip Hop Museum January 18th, 2019. Now, tell us, you produced for Dr. J. Yeah, I did it, Johnny. Uh, the song I, 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 was, I was honored to do for Dre was uh, called The Message. And that's with uh, Dre featuring uh, Mary J. Blige. What was that like? What was working with Drake? Was it out in Cali? Was it in New York? No, it was. Of course, it was in Cali. You know, um, it was. It was organic. I couldn't predict what was going on at the time. It just happened. Did Dre mix your record? Of course. I mean, I wasn't going to mix it. You know, that's the. That's the head chef right there. You know. So, and the beat that you did for him, what in, what what weapon of choice did? You, what was that? An SB12 beat? That was, was SB12. SB1200. SB12. SB12. And uh, the music was played. People keep. I see y'all on. Uh, what's that? Who sample? Trying to tell me what I used for that. That that wasn't no sample. That's played. So uh, do oh, yourself. Oh, so you played everything on that? No, record. I haven't played it. Uh, my man Dinky Bingham played that. But I see people trying to say, well, it's just sample and it's that. No, it's Dinky just not a Bingham. Sample. Right. Dinky Bingham is the father of Youngy, uh, Yummy Bingham, the singer, the female singer. Sure. From the group, she was in a group called Lorraine. So, yeah, the musical family. Well, you just talented. dispelled a lot of people's, you know, misconceptions right there. Coming in all the way from uh, Philadelphia, of course, the one and only signed DJ Jazzy Jeff. Uh, Serato controllers. So these are custom Serato controllers, but DJ Jazzy Jeff edition with all these kind of cool, kind of cool looking, huh? And then signed by the one and only Jazzy Jeff. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. What you got over there, B Dub? All the way from Pine Valley, California. Where my 420 friendly family at? Clap it up if you 420 friendly fan in here. I like that. I like that shit. High times. Y'all familiar with the High Times magazine? Oh, so man. this is going with our Snoop display. Yes, sir. Because that's what we like to do. Wow. Here. I don't know about you. Where was that coming in from? Uh, Pine Valley, California, I believe. Oh, uh, yeah, Pine of Valley. course. Of course, right? Here's the final item. And uh, it's an incredibly special episode for us, uh, Finesse, to have a guy like yourself on. Not just because of your own, you know, music and, and, and DITC crew. Uh, I'll add one to y'all. <gasps> Oh, I'm about to, Elizabeth coming to you. Oh my God, I'm, I, you got me shaking. I can't believe Come this. See you, Elizabeth. You got, you guys. Oh my God, and this is a 45 of Baby You Nasty from Lord Finesse's very first debut album. Oh my goodness, if we can get you to sign that, that's amazing. Up oh, here's a whole new color. Nope. Special edition. What? What? Hold on a second. Hold on. I think I know where this came from. Is this from a Slice of Spice Records? Yeah, but not where, sh good. where should they get them? This color is, you can't get this color. It can only be get, gotten from me. So, uh, only gotten from you. Right, that color. Sorry, I'm freaking out, y'all. I'm totally freaking out. Okay, but on another note, are you working with Slice of Spice these days on anything? Yeah, I mean, but, you've, um, I got a couple of projects coming out next year. Uh, I mean, for the archivists, you know, for the Awakening fans, y'all gonna get something beyond incredible, you know? Really? Yeah. Coming soon? Coming soon. From Slice to Spice? Um, I gotta finish it first. I don't know if it's <laughs> coming out. 
Oh, you haven't finished it. Okay. All right. Well, coming all the way from... This is our very last unboxing of the day, you guys. And this is coming from Toluca Lake, California. Have you ever been to Toluca Lake? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably. I, I suspect they have a lake there. This is kind of a, a lot of a few things. Ready? Murder was the case. Speed up. Hook me up. Put them out. Put them out. Murder was the case. Uh, what am I looking at right now? NWA, Ethel for Zagan. Oh, this is the entire album's videos on unopened. Look at that. Oh, no, sort of open. Still shrink wrapped. VHS. Wow, this is quite a lot, huh? Oh, wow. Ice T's OG. And we were just talking about how uh, the Trespass soundtrack was uh, produced by Lord Finesse because of Ice T. Is that right? Definitely. How'd you meet Ice T? I met Ice T in the seminar in 1989. At, wait, at same that same one, seminar? Yeah. Same so your entire career is traced back to one seminar. Yeah. That's kind of amazing. We found out the same thing happened with who was that who won that competition? Master Ace. Who's that? Right. Master That's Ace, cool. same thing. Go to seminars, people. Yeah, go, go to if you seminars. Haven't learned anything, go to seminars. So. Right? Yeah, they don't have those no more. No, they don't. Those they don't. don't exist. What's this? Are you familiar with? Uh, you ever uh, work with or meet Tupac? I met Tupac. Hung out with him. Yeah. Tupac was a wild dude. Wild dude. This is a really incredible lot. Lifers Group. Are you familiar with that? Beat up. That out on uh, what's that basic? The same. I know it was the same label as uh, Organized Confusion. Hmm. Uh, Organized Confusion. Uh, stress killed. Destroy stress. The two live crew pop that coochie. Man, I've been waiting for this. Oh, finally it came. Finesse. You're our good luck charm. Pop that coochie. Going right in the hip hop museum. And the last two videos from Toluca Lake. Or, you can hold that one, Tupac, Th Thug Immortal, yeah, and uh, Cocktails, spelled differently, <laughs> spelled I don't know about that one. like someone's tail. Okay, it's an interesting end to this. It, in <laughs> it's kind of anticlimactic, I'm sorry. But in closing, where you have a nice little DMV tour going on for the next few days. Can you tell everyone where they might be able to find you? Well, um, I'm going to be at, what, Records and Rarity? Yeah. Rarities. Uh, that's in Tyson's Corner. Corner. Tomorrow. Right. And then right here in DMV, D.C., uh, 18th Street Lounge. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. And is that tonight? That's tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Well, Let's 18th Street Lounge is a very you know famous place around here. Yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it's the top be, spot. It's gonna be historic tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, you know, well, yeah. it's already historic now because yeah. we are so lucky to induct you into the museum. And if people want to reach out to you, if uh, they want to pay you top top dollar, and I'm talking top dollar to produce a track for them, where can they find you or get in contact with you? Uh, the underboss at Ymail. You know, people be like Ymail. That was like a, a offset of uh, what's that? Uh, Yahoo. So instead of Yahoo, it's the underboss, T H E U N D E R B O S S at Y M A I L dot com. Y yeah, if, if you fuck that up, you, you're retarded because that was the very specific directions to get at you. Yeah. And um, the 45s, these will be available tomorrow. Oh. Tyson's Corner. Oh, okay. They're Amazing. Available. Amazing. <laughs> Understand that color, that splatterproof color, is, you can only get that from me. So if you, oh, you can find somebody who brought it from me and probably, you know, they probably up the ante about three or four times. You know? Also, shout, shout out to Dustin Burdett and Ryan over at Records and Rarities. Um, but Definitely. For now, we are District Spotlight. I'm Jeremy Beaver, CEO and founder of Listen Vision with the one, the only. Beat up the boy wonder. And until next Friday at 5, peace, we're out of here.